Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Hope you're all doing well this morning. Before we start, we start song service, a little fun fact. I was walking down with my mom. Oh, actually, before that, I went to pick her up from her house. And we're both wearing the same colors. See my mom? We're both wearing blue, the same color blue. And then I'm walking down the church, and I see Angie and Mark. and. Look at them. They're matchy-matchy, too. So, it, and neither of us planned any of this, but that's how we are. I just thought it was fun to mention that. Anyway, um, I hope you're having a good day, and we will start our song service by singing Tis So Sweet to Trust, uh, to Trust in Jesus. So it's a different title from what you see here, but it's correct behind you, uh, behind you and in front of, uh, behind me and in front of me, okay. So Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, number 524.
Amen. And for our opening hymn, please rise. We will sing Wake the Song, number 34. <laughs> Savature family, it is good to be home. I was away for two weeks for my regular school classes, and outside is nice, but home is better. I went to church there, but let me tell you, what, what makes a difference from, from a place to be a regular place or to be home? What makes a difference from a house? to your home, or from a church to your home. It's the, the people, it's the love, it's the fellowship, it's the relationship, it's the warmth, it's the little details. So many of us, we don't have probably a home established, but we do have all one common relationship with Jesus. And the beauty of Jesus being available for all of us as our brother, as our creator, as a Lord, is that wherever we go, as long as we are with Jesus, we are home. Amen. So welcome home. Can you turn around and just say, welcome home to the other person?
Now, if you are visiting with us today, we have all the elements. We have the place, we have the loving, warm people, and we have Jesus. So please be welcome to this, your home, from now on, because today you're visiting. Next time, your family. All right? I do have some announcements. Uh, today we have the first reading for Miss Eileen Lee. She's transferring out to the Korean church. So we're just uh, announcing this as the first reading. The next week we're going to vote for this. And um, Psalm 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. So the first element, the first builder, the first one that we need to make a house and a home is the Lord. We have a wonderful potluck, as usual, after service. So please, you are welcome to stay and share with us, especially those who are visiting. I'm going to make a short parenthesis here in Spanish because I know we have some Spanish friends today that are not speaking English. So para ustedes, los que no entienden inglés y no hablan, especialmente queremos darle la bienvenida y pedirles que se queden y compartan con nosotros. Después del culto tenemos un bonito almuerzo y queremos que sean parte de nuestra familia. Bienvenidos. All right. Uh, we have a reminder. Today at 1.30, right after lunch, we have a business meeting. We're going to have some updates and we're going to discuss some church matters. So please uh, make your provision to stay for a few minutes. It's not going to be long, just maybe three, four hours. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. But we, we would like to have your presence here. Whatever uh, we discuss and we decide in the, in the business meeting supersedes the board. We are the voice of the church. So please, please stay after lunch, 1.30. And next week, be prepared uh, in your heart and in your relationships for communion service, make peace with God and with other people, and come ready and prepare for next week for um, communion service. We're also going to have one baptism at least, maybe more. So let's celebrate that as well. We have uh, some prayer requests. I have um, Jennifer uh, traveling from Utah, and uh, for traveling mercies, we have an unspoken prayer that the Lord knows exactly what it is. Uh, we pray for Marcia and Ermelinda Gale for health issues, and actually for every person who suffers specifically for, for mental uh, problems, mental health problems. We have Louise for illness, another unspoken, and Vera and Brad, just prayers. I would like to also to add uh, my mom, that she, she fell and she's recovering, so for, for safe recovery. And also uh, my wife that is uh, struggling a little bit with anxiety, so let us just keep ourselves in prayer for each other. So for all of you who are able to kneel down, we kneel down, we sing our uh, invocation prayer song, and then we will pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for adopting us and receiving us into your family. Whenever you are, Lord, their home is. So thank you, Lord, for making us feel and be at home. Lord, today we come here to worship you. 
to humbly present our lives, our minds, our thoughts, our deeds before you. And plead, Lord, we ask you that you examine our hearts and see if there is any wickedness in them. And cleanse it, Lord, with your forgiveness, with your mercy, with the blood of Jesus Christ. And renew a new heart in us, Lord. Change us into your likeness and makes us, make us, Lord, a different people. A people of God, a people of Jesus that lives and shares your love. We welcome you in your own house when we are welcome. And we pray that you present, especially the Holy Spirit of God will be poured upon this church, Lord. Empower us, ignite us on the holy fire, Lord, that we may accomplish what you have commissioned us to go to every corner and reach every soul that we can. Help us to be a light beacon in this area and in our homes, in our communities. Receive our worship because we are here to honor you and to exalt your name, Father God. We also bring before you our needs and our petitions because only you can take care of all of them and, and, and resolve them in the perfect way. You heard the names and the prayers, Lord. And I also ask you that at this moment you hear every silent petition in each person's heart. Because who else we have but you? And you are sufficient. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for making us acceptable and worthy. Not because of who we are, but because who you made us to be. And all of this, Lord, in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Oh. <laughs> Woo, made it. <laughs> All right. Last week, Sheldon talked about the, um, the seven days of creation and how God just spoke the words and things appeared. But with humans, he actually formed them with his hands and he breathed life into them. Now, do you guys remember... What was created on the fifth day? I'm sorry. 
Yeah, the fifth day. What was created on the fifth day? Do you guys remember? You know what's an easy way to remember things? Something? You're right. Yes. You, you know, our God is a God of um, order. He created light, and then he separated the waters, and then he created land. And then he filled it in that same sequence. The fourth was light. He created the planets, um, the sun and moon stars. Then he filled the air and the seas. And then he filled the land on the sixth day. So just kind of a, a little, little mnemonic to remember um, how creation was uh, made. But anyway, I'm going to talk about something that was created on the fifth day, which was birds and fishes. But we're going to talk about birds. Okay. Um, do you know when God made man, he made human kind, right? One kind of human. When he created birds, did he create one kind of bird? No. No. He created a lot of birds. So I tried to figure out how many birds there are here in Monterey, how many types. And the only thing I can come up with was how many types of seabirds. Not just birds in the forest, in the hills, but just seabirds. Any guess on how many kind of seabirds there are in Monterey Bay? Types. 32? 32. A little higher. Uh, one? A little higher than one. 64. A little higher than 64. There are 90 types of seabirds in the Monterey Bay alone. 90 types of seabirds, and that doesn't include sparrows and pigeons and other birds that are on land. Now, I'm going to have one of my assistants come here. Can you open this up and show the kids what you have here? What do you think this is? Some bird's nest. If you look closely, you'll see there's white hair and brown hair. That's probably from a horse to make the nest soft. OK, so look at, look at what else is on there. You see little twigs and different things that are made to make this nest for this bird. So it's probably a smaller bird, right? OK, now my next assistant, can you show what you have here? It is a bird's nest, but look at what this is made out of. It's like bigger branches and sticks. There's different kinds of birds, right? OK. Now, can you, can you hold this one? With two hands. Yeah. OK, so what do you think this is? It's not a sock. It's actually a bird's nest as well. And if you look closely, you'll see a little hole here. This is probably some kind of weaver bird. This was also found in this area in Monterey. And the last one, my favorite. What kind of bird's nest do you think this is? It's a hummingbird nest. It was from an oak tree. And if you look closely, you'll see some Spanish moss. And they camouflaged it to make it look like an oak tree. Isn't that interesting? OK. So I want to read you this verse. This is found in Psalms 50, verse 11. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Now, how many birds does God know in the mountains? All the birds. Now, do you know how many birds there are in the world? 30 billion birds at any one time. For every human, there's six birds. That's a lot of birds. And God knows all the birds. So I'm going to read one more verse here. Sorry, just give me a moment. Yeah. 
Okay, this is found in Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. They, are you not of more value than they? So God knows all 30 billion birds, maybe even by name. How did God create us? Did he just speak the words? He formed us. We are very special to him. If God knows the birds, how much more does he know you? So whenever you are worried or stressed out, just remember God loves you so much. He knows everything about you. All you have to do is pray. Okay? All right. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Dear Lord, we thank you for our blessings. We thank you for loving us so much and that whenever we need Whenever we need you, whenever we are worried, we can just pray and you will take care of us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And uh, let's prepare ourselves to hear the word of God and um, so that it sinks into our mind, soul, and heart. So let's pre I'll be reading two scriptures, uh, one from Matthew and one from Philipp Philippians. So the first one is from Matthew chapter 28, and I'm reading verses 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I, with you, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So uh, the next one is from Philippians, uh, and it's chapter 2, uh, verses 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. We hear this uh, word in the name of God. Amen. 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 Uh, this morning, it's my privilege to introduce or maybe reintroduce Dr. Elissa Keto. Uh, we go back a long time to Pacific Union College. Um, I figured out once that I had been in formal education for 27 years, starting from the first grade until I finished my last residency. And of those years, 24 of them were spent in Adventist institutions. I have a great debt, I owe a great debt to Adventist education. I don't think I'd even be a physician if it weren't for Adventist education. Now, you know, when you're, you've known somebody this long, you're tempted to reminisce and say things that maybe you shouldn't. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I just want you to uh, note the bio which has been supplied. Uh, and this has been a real champion 
for Christian education. And uh, we're really privileged to have her speak to us. And uh, this is the third time she's been here, but I hope it won't be the last, Dr. Keto. Well, there was a little debate back there in between the two services as to whether I had been here three times or four times. Uh, I'm not sure which is accurate. All I can remember is I know I've been here at least two times, so, um, and, and that I haven't spoken on this topic. But um, I'm asking you a question. Are you a multiplier? And I'm going to, no? This one, did you say? No, I have to turn it on. Oh. oh, we just have to turn it on. This button. Okay, thank you. So I, uh, I work at La Sierra University, but I have the privilege of volunteer teaching at one of our small schools in Moreno Valley, California. And I say small because I think it has maybe 32 students for two classrooms. And I happen to be the um, volunteer to teach the eighth graders writing. I have five eighth graders in my class. And I tell you that because we have been working on using sources. And I said to them, and I taught them, now there are different kinds of ways to use sources, but a lot of beginning writers tend to plagiarize. That is, to copy some ideas that they read in wherever, Wikipedia, which is where they go to first, or, or my students do. So I said there are three kinds, basically, three kinds of plagiarism. There's global plagiarism, where you take the whole thing and you say, oh, okay, here it is, and you don't cite the source. Or there's um, patchwork plagiarism, which you take a little here, and a little here, and a little here, and you put it all together. And then there's incremental plagiarism, where you do one here, and then two here, and then three here, incremental. And uh, so this morning, my five eighth graders would be surprised to hear me say, I have committed plagiarism. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you why. I want to share with you something from this book called Multipliers. Notice this, the subtitles. What is it? How the best leaders make everyone smarter. How the best leaders make everyone smarter by Liz Wiseman. You should ask yourself about that subtitle. Can we really make everyone smarter if we're the right kind of leader? And today, even though she's talking about business people within the business world, I would like to suggest to you that wherever there are two people together, one of, you, one of those people is a leader. So, so you could be a mother with your two children and your husband, you could be a leader, okay? So don't exclude yourself and say, well, she's talking about business, well, how, how does it apply to me? I'm gonna say it applies to all, all of us sitting here in this uh, sanctuary. So she says, you, you can do this. And I want to share with you her ideas, um, sometimes globally, all right? But here we go. All right, Liz Wiseman went to 150, so she included 150 selected leaders in this study. She interviewed at 35 companies, large companies, over four continents. And she conducted these interviews from October 2007 to October 2009. And then she published her first book, 2010, and she subsequently came out with a revision uh, in 2017. So I'm going to share with you what she found out from her research. She said there are people who are multipliers. 
And who are multipliers? Well, she says they're leaders who make everyone smarter. This is what I want you to question. Everyone smarter, okay? They're persons who use their intelligence to amplify and, sorry, I amplify and bring out the smarts and capability of those around them. All right, so amplify and bring out the smarts. There are five times of multipliers she has decided after her research, and there are the talent magnets, the liberate, liberators, the challengers, the debate makers, and the investors. So briefly, talent magnets attract talent to them or cultivate talent that they have. The liberators allow a kind of environment that liberates people so that they can think their best and be their best. Challengers are those that can look and say, hey, I wonder about that. They can challenge an idea or a process and want to make things better. Then there are debate makers. Now, Liz Wiseman is big on debate. She says a good multiplier, not a good multiplier, take that, strike that. A multiplier has debate before decision. So he allows people to talk and talk and debate, and then they make a decision. And then there are the investors. There are leaders who say, my, my employees are very important to me, and I am going to invest in them to try to make them better. So now if you have five multipliers, what do you think the other people are? What? Dividers. Divi yeah, well, it starts with a D, correct. Dividers would be fine, or she calls them diminishers. Okay, so if you look at the titles that she gives them, gives them it, they're pretty much self-explanatory. Okay, there's the empire builder. She doesn't really care about her employees. She's just wanting to build this uh, whatever company. Okay, the know-it-all. You people know a lot of know-it-alls, don't you? Or you know some know-it-alls. Or you have known some know-it-alls, right? Um, oh, I forgot the tyrant. Oh, my goodness. The tyrant. Imagine, okay, a leader as a tyrant. And then there's the decision maker. Now, here's where if you are a diminisher, you follow a different process. You make the decision yourself, and then you tell your group about it, and then you discuss it but you have made the decision yourself in isolation. Then there's the micromanager. I want you to pay close attention to that micromanager. Do you know people who are micromanagers? Oh, I heard a lot of, yes, you do. Could, could I hear that again? Do you know a lot of micromanagers? Oh, okay, very good, all right. They're kind of easy to identify, right? Micromanagers. All right, so now I'm not going to go over the description because the titles, I think, say it all. The identifiers say it all. Here's the interesting, here's the interesting part about it, and I'm not going to work through all those. You saw those, but now I put them side by side. Liz Wiseman found that the diminishers barely got 50% of the capability of her teams. Notice specifically it was only 48%. On the other hand, with a multiplier leader, the multiplier got two times the capability that the, that, uh, the diminisher did, and it was almost 100%, 95%. What was that? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay, uh, I think Liz would appreciate that. All right, so, so here's a contrast now, diminishers and multipliers. Now, um, we're going to talk about accidental diminishers. So they're diminishers who don't really intend to be diminishers, okay? As it says up here, they have good intentions, but they underutilize the talents and skills 
of their people. But they're not deliberate diminishers. So let's see what kind of, excuse me, what kind of accidental diminishers she has identified. All right, oh, whoops, somehow. There you go, okay. So you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we're gonna quickly identify the types of accidental diminishers. And you know, just see if my, you might fall into one of these categories. And just be grateful for the adjective accidental, that you're not doing it on purpose, but it's accidental. All right, so we have the visionaries. Oh, it's great to be a visionary, right? And we appreciate visionary people who do visionary thinking for us. However, notice what Wiseman found. She said that they're big thinkers, yes. They are too prescriptive with a vision, though. When they have this vision, they want it to be specifically, exactly like they vision it. And then they don't leave enough space for others to think through their idea or their vision to make a vision a reality. And here's the negative thing. Well, here's, here's an example. There was a, the leader of, um, well, I, sorry, let me go back. Here's a quotation. There is such a huge gap between what he is telling us to do and what we actually can do. We just give up. So the visionary throws out this vision. It's so big, they said, we can't deal with it right in the, way, in the form he's given us. We have no idea how we can make his vision a reality. That's the visionary. Now we have idea guys. I think it's good to have idea guys, don't you think? You want people with ideas. Um, I bet you have idea guys here at this church who say, maybe we've been doing it this way for a long time. Why don't we try to do it this way? And they present the idea. OK, so there are fountains of creativity. It's good to be creative, isn't it? I'm not sure about nonstop ideas, but ideas are good, OK? But in the company or in the team, you have people scurrying around to keep up with each, each new idea. Do you know anybody like that? Let's do this at the church, and then let's do that at the church. So he comes in on Monday, and he tells us what we need to do, the idea what we need to do for the competition. But it's not just this Monday. It's like every Monday. And then there's a new goal to chase every week, each week. That's why every Monday comes with a, a new idea, or she comes in with a new idea. Now these are, remember, these are accidental diminishers. All right, so they're the optimists. You know, I think that if, this is a sideline, but I think that if you're a Christian, you have to be optimistic. That's just my, you have to have hope and optimism. But, you know, there might be some um, downsides of always being an optimist. They want to create a belief, okay, that the team can do it. But the outcome is people wonder if they appreciate the struggle and the poss possibility of failure. So those who are working with the optimists are saying, I hope that he or she appreciates, if we go forward with this, what the struggle will be, and also that we might fail. There's a possibility of failure. Now we have the rapid responder or the rapid response. They try to keep up their organization on top of everything, and they want to move fast. But in moving fast, their organization moves slowly because there's a traffic jam of too many decisions or changes. That's with the uh, rapid responder. Here's the pace setter. Sets a high standard either for quality 
or pace or quantity, and the outcome is other people become spec uh, spectators or give up when they see they can't keep up. You know, it's just running so far ahead of us that I just might as well sit down and wait till they come back again. Then there's the rescuers. I think many of us might say that we're rescuers. See if, see if this description applies to you. Well-intending managers jump into the fray and try to rescue everybody, or the t their people, or the team. They create chronic dependencies on the leader. So the, the employees or the team says, well, if it doesn't go so well, we'll just wait till he comes in and helps us. There was a new vice president at Gap, this was quite a while ago, at Gap, who stopped, decided to stop jumping in and then shifted the burden to the employees and gave them uh, the li liberty and freedom to do it on their own and also, a, get, but also, uh, acquired or required greater accountability. They had to be accountable. And um, as you know, GAP is still around. So now I have a question to ask you. Are you an accidental diminisher? Or have you ever been an accidental diminisher? Now I don't want you to raise your hands, but you have some options here. Yes, no, not sure, or unwilling to admit? Uh, anybody? Yes, no, sure, unwilling to admit. I would say all of us fall into one of these categories. But notice that I'm giving us the benefit of the doubt that we're accidental diminishers, not purposeful diminishers. OK, so let me begin. I'm willing to admit, and I'm going to tell you what kind of accidental diminisher I was, and maybe I still have some remnants of it. I was great at micromanaging. If you ask me to micromanage now, I'll say, no problem. But it's not the best thing for me. My husband is sitting in the, aud in the audience, so he might you know, be able to verify this or not. But I, I'm, a, I'm a very good micromanager. The other thing that I'm good at thinking is I think that I can um, um, toss three balls up in the air at one time and do pretty well. OK? Multitask. One day, we, my husband Danny and I were having a conversation. And he said to me, I said, I said I'm, I'm getting so that I'm not so good at multitasking. It doesn't seem I can do as many things, balls, as I used to. And he looked at me, and he was serious. And he said, whoever told you you could? <laughs> now, this was a while ago, because now you know the research on multitasking shows that people, people don't do as well when they try to multitask. Correct? I have the brain, my husband's a brain person, so it's true, OK? So, um, but I know that I'm good at multi, not multi, I'm good at micromanaging. So I can micromanage well. Anybody else want any, make any confessions? Any of these accidental diminishers? OK. So um, this concept this concept of multi multiplier leader and accidental diminisher flooded was she was the Wall Street bestseller, then the New York bestseller, you know, and she proposes that you can go from accidental diminisher to multiplier leader, OK? You can go 
go from being a diminisher to a leader, accidental diminisher. Now, the father of modern management, Drucker, Peter Drucker says, I'm more interested in people than I am in how businesses work. And he's the father of modern management, okay? She says, I'm more interested in people. And then something else he says is, leadership is not magnetic personality. That can just be as well be a glib tongue. Leadership is lifting a person's vision to higher sights. Notice that, a person's vision to higher sights. Um, I want to pause here and s tell you about something that happened yesterday. So yesterday after morning, with the help of my husband, he arranged to have my fifth, my five eighth graders tour the medical center at Loma Linda. And the first half was going to be in the Department of Radiology. Um, a radiologist, a radiology physicist did that first hour tour. And then the second hour tour was going to be, um, I don't know what you call him, the administrator of the hospital. Is that what we should call Adrian Cotton? Something like that. Okay. Why did we want them, why did I want them to, to go and have this tour? I am teaching in a school that has, stu has students from low socioeconomic uh, environment. They'd never been to a medical center like this. They'd never been to a radiology um, department. So I, w I wanted them to see some possibilities because they're eighth graders going to be ninth graders. So we arranged for this tour. And uh, on Tuesday, when I meet with them, I'll see how it went. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that it, I'm not hoping. I'm positive it went well. I'm positive it went well. But the, the higher sight that I'm getting, wanting them to do is not just to go to high school, but after high school to go to college. So I would hope that I could help them do that by giving them a vision to higher sites. Now that's Peter Drucker. Now I'm gonna move on to ancient times. And this is Jesus. Would you agree that Jesus is a multiplier? Yes. Would you agree that Jesus is probably the ultimate multi multiplier? Okay, so you know, he multiplied the physical stuff, the fishes and the loaves. Yeah? And then he sent those 12 disciples all over the world. They went to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the world, right? Earth. Now, have any of you been um, watching The Chosen on television? Only one, oh, two, two. Okay, I've only watched a couple of episodes, and uh, I'm not sure why we didn't watch more, but anyway, we watched a couple. And the, the episodes that we, we saw had to do with the disciples' interaction with one another. Now, you know, of course, that the Bible doesn't record all of that. However, so they have to use a little imagination and creativity and try to figure out what it was that the disciples were, might have questions about, are arguing about. And uh, they had a lot of questions, all right? And they were questioning Jesus and his uh, strategies and where Jesus put the emphasis. So we got a glimpse, a fictitious glimpse into what they might have been thinking. But eventually, I think, and, and I think you could imagine that with 12 people, right? Put 12 people together. And, um, and yet, look where they initially started, and then from there, they went to the whole world. This is 12. So I say to you, Jesus helped the, his disciples become multipliers. And what, then what did they do? 
Yes, they changed the world. They evangelized the whole world, you know? Just 12. And note the impact Christianity has had on the world, okay? It's influenced nations, cultures, history, art, literature, judicial systems, you name it. This is from 12 multipliers. But would you say that they had to go out then and create multipliers? Yes? Okay. So Jesus started, this, the, uh, started it. They went out. They created multipliers. They could never have evangelized the world themselves with being only 12. So I want to ask you, what kind of worldview do you think multipliers have? What kind of worldview? That is, how do they see the world? And I want to suggest to you that there are four major worldviews, and they're here. There's feelings first. Person is governed by feelings mostly. Or there's rules first, governed by rules mostly. And a lot of, I think, religious people are governed by rules. Then there's me first, thinking, oh, <coughs> excuse me, thinking only of myself. Me, me, me. And some people have suggested that our young people are me, 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 okay? They're looking in the um, phone, taking selfies, you know, that sort of thing. And it's strictly me. And then there's the fourth worldview, and that's others first. So you probably will come back around to it, but uh, the, one of the memory texts had to do with putting others first. So others first. So of these worldviews, what one do, ha, does the multiplier subscribe to? Yeah, I heard number four. I heard four, right? Others first. Okay. So here's what the Bible says. Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility... Value others above yourselves. Notice that. Value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Amen. Philippians. See what you think about this translation. Actually, it's not a translation. It's a paraphrase by Eugene Peterson from the Message Bible. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Mm -hmm. Do you like that contempt? That's the, from the message. I see somebody shaking their head yes, and thank you. He likes it. Okay. This is what the Bible says about, and I would venture to say, this is, this is others' first worldview from, from the Bible, okay? Here's this, the others' first worldview. Now, here are some benefits I listed for having that kind of worldview. First of all, you become a multiplier. Then you can improve interpersonal relationships. You can optimize your mental and spiritual growth. And lastly, you can make decisions better than chance. I can't talk about two, three, and four, really. But, but we could talk about it in another, at another time. But here are some benefits. If you adopt the wor other's first worldview, you can become, first of all, a multiplier. And then these kinds of things will happen as well. Oops, I have to go back, I think. Okay, how many of you have I've heard of or read this book? All right, a bunch of you, right? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey wrote the introduction to the multipliers, and this is what he says. He says, just imagine... What would happen to our world if every leader on the planet took one step from diminisher to multiplier? 
What would happen to our world, he says, if we did this? Okay, and then he tells us it can be done. But you know, um, the ways that both Liz Wiseman and Stephen Covey propose, yes, we can follow those steps or process, but I'd like to suggest that there are some other things we need to look at. Several years ago, maybe now, I don't know, 20 years ago, Danny, he came home one day and he said to me, you need to know about mirror neurons. You need to learn about mirror neurons. And I said, why? He said, it'll make all the difference in the world when you approach educating people and trying to help people learn. So mirror neurons are some very special neurons in our brain that act like mirrors, okay? So, so, whoops, you see the little baby mirroring what the baby sees in the adult, okay? Have you thought about when you yawn, are you yawning because there's something in the air? or that you are seeing a mirror, you're visualizing something and a mirror neuron is happening, okay? I would suggest it's not something in the air, okay? It's not something in the air. All right. Um, so let's say, let's say I don't know how to manipulate this. Uh-huh, uh okay. So let's just say, you know, Don mentioned that I've been in education for a long time. Let's just say in our schools, in our schools, if when the student comes to school, they see all around them, not Jesus per se, but Jesus in behavior, okay? So they, say, they see people mirroring the kind of behavior that Jesus would engage in. What kind of effect would that have on the students with always having this mirror image of Jesus? Would, could that, would that affect their character? Yes. I think that it would. Um, and so, you know, as I said, Covey and Wiseman talk about you know, do this, do this, do this, do that, and you can become a multiplier. I'm suggesting to you that it's not as easy as do this, do that. I'm suggesting to you that God has created in our brain mirror neurons that can help us become like Jesus, that can help us become a multiplier. He hasn't just said, you know, do this step and this step. No, he has created our brains so that, in fact, we can achieve that. Excuse me? By beholding. Yes, yes, that's the text. By beholding, we become changed, right? So the ultimate multiplier is Jesus. I think we'd all agree on that. And what an impact he had. Now I'm going to leave you with this. Um, am I in the minute? Am I still OK? Um, I'm going to leave you with this quotation. And since I've been in the mode of confessing today, I have another confession. I didn't know where to put this quotation, but I knew I wanted to, put, to pass it on to you. I just didn't know where I was going to put it in my PowerPoint. So that's my second confession. I hope you'll forgive me. But it's a great... Warren Bennis, he's also from business, he said none of us is as smart as all of us. How many of you agree with that? Okay, not everybody in this audience agrees with that because most of the people didn't raise their hands. So I'm assuming you don't agree with this, okay? I'm assuming you think, oh no, I'm, I'm smart, nobody is smart as I am. Or Don is smart, but none of us can possibly as smart, you know. But what if Don were to, I think Don is smart. What if Don were to say, hey, let's all get together, okay, and work on this project together? 
none of us is as smart as all of us. I really believe that. I think the Bible, I think that's a biblical principle as Jesus showed us, right? Why didn't Jesus just go out and say, forget about those disciples, they're just so much trouble. You know, they're arguing, they're this, they're this. Master, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know, no. He said none of us, he didn't say this, but none of us is as smart as all of us. All of us together, disciples, he said. When he went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, did he go by himself? No, he took people with him. So I leave this thought with you. None of us is as smart as all of us. And I bet if we operated on that principle, life would be a lot easier, but not only that, be a lot happier. Thank you so much. Um, next time they say keto is coming, say, really, again? <laughs> you know, OK. All right, thank you so much. Oh, I think I have to give prayer, right? Is that it? Oh, the close, closing song. Page 573, yes.
Let's pray. Our gracious God, thank you so much for giving us brains and the Holy Spirit so that we too can go out and be multipliers as you did, so we can be others first worldview. Thank you for this, and thank you for the Sabbath day. Amen.